Jim Morrison. Since his death, his fame has endured as one of popular culture's most rebellious and often displayed icons representing the generation gap and the youth counterculture. Morrison was a man who was spectacularly good at being a rock star, a lithe figure in leather trousers, prophesying about death, sex and magic on some of the biggest hits of the 1960s. Light my fire, break on through, hello, I love you. Though Jim Morrison was catastrophically bad at the rest of life, he could be reckless, selfish and mercurial. James Douglas Morrison, otherwise known as Jim Morrison, was an American singer, songwriter, musician and poet. He was the lead singer of the rock band The Doors. Due to his wild personality, poetic lyrics, distinctive voice, unpredictable and erratic performances, and to the dramatic circumstances surrounding his life and early death, Morrison is regarded by music critics and fans as one of the most iconic and influential frontmen in rock history. Jim's father was a Korean Navy officer who transferred from base to base during his son's childhood, but by Jim's early teens, the family had settled in Alexandria, Virginia. After finishing high school in Alexandria, Morrison took several classes at St. Petersburg Junior College and Florida State University before pulling up roots in 1964 and heading for the West Coast. By 1966, the 22-year-old Morrison was enrolled in film classes at the University of California at Los Angeles, but a friendship with fellow student Ray Manzarek would sideline any plans he had of becoming a filmmaker. While the two young men had known each other only casually as fellow students, they ran into each other one day by accident on a Venice, Californian beach. Manzarek, an organist, along with Morrison, guitarist Robbie Krieger and drummer John Densmore, decided to form their own rock band to put their songs to music. The young men decided to call their group The Doors, a name inspired by a quote from 19th century English poet William Blake. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is infinite. As Morrison was fond of saying, there are things known and things unknown and in between are the doors. A long-term gig at the famous Whiskey A Go-Go on Hollywood's Sunset Strip allowed the doors to develop their stage presence and it eventually drew the attention of talent scouts searching for new recording acts. Not the least of the group's attractions was Morrison, who sang in a husky baritone, wore skin-tight pants, and went even further than Elvis Presley had in incorporating sexually suggestive movements into his onstage performances. With lyrics like, Come on baby, light my fire, Morrison drove young women wild. Soon the Doors started gaining popularity as a powerful rock band. The band earned national recognition after signing with Elektra Records in 1967 and the Doors reached the top spot with their hit single Light My Fire, which peaked at number one on the US Billboard Hot 100. On September the 17th, 1967, the Doors were invited to perform on the Ed Sullivan Show. Moments before they were to go live, Ed Sullivan requested that Jim change the lyric in Light My Fire from Girl We Couldn't Get Much Higher to Girl We Couldn't Get Much Better. Jim agreed to the change. However, when he performed the song on national TV, he either forgot out of nervousness or completely dismissed the request and sang the song with its original lyric. The next six shows which had been planned for The Doors to perform were quickly cancelled by Sullivan. After the release of their first album, the group went back into the studio and cut Strange Days, both of which came out in 1967. Other albums would include Waiting for the Sun in 1968, The Soft Parade 1969, Morrison Hotel 1960. 70, Absolutely Live in 1970, and finally LA Woman in 1971. Morrison, interested in Native American law and the images of the American deserts, dubbed himself the Lizard King and wrote several songs, including Celebration of the Lizard in reference to his reptilian alter ego. Caught up in a wave of popularity, the young band found itself carried into a new world where drugs, alcohol and sex play 
played a major role. Morrison, whose status as a celebrity had begun almost overnight, found it difficult to handle the change. His growing dependence on alcohol would dim his talent in the years that followed, and the superstar status made him believe he was immune to normal authority. Jim was no stranger to the law. On September the 23rd, 1963, in Tallahassee, Florida, Jim Morrison was charged with petty larceny, disturbing the peace, resisting arrest, and public drunkenness at a football game. Morrison allegedly got rowdy and made fun of the football players. In addition, he stole an umbrella and a helmet from the open window of a police car, though the charges were later dropped. Morrison became the first ever rock artist to be arrested while performing on stage. On December the 9th, 1967, Morrison was found by a police officer with a girl in a shower stall before his performance at the New Haven Arena in New Haven, Connecticut. The officer told Morrison to beat it to which Morrison replied, eat it. Morrison was maced by the officer and the show was delayed while Morrison recovered. Later, halfway through the set, Morrison decided to recount the story to the audience. His version was laden with obscenities and belittled the New Haven police. Morrison was promptly arrested and was taken to the local police station where he was booked on charges of indecency, and public obscenity. The charges were later dropped due to lack of evidence. On January the 28th, 1968, at the Pussycat A Go-Go in Las Vegas, Morrison was charged with public drunkenness and vagrancy. It was reported that Morrison was smoking a cigarette like a joint, which caught the attention of some heavy-hitting bouncers. He was knocked on the head by one of the bouncers and chaos soon followed. Morrison was promptly arrested. On November the 9th, 1969, in Phoenix, Arizona, Morrison was booked into a city jail for drunk and disorderly conduct and for interfering with flight crew and attendants on a Continental Airlines flight. Jim and his friend Tom Baker were on their way to Phoenix to watch a Rolling Stones concert. Morrison had previously been blacklisted from performing in Phoenix in 1968 after almost causing a riot during one of his shows. Then on March the 1st, 1969, at the Dinner Key Auditorium in the Coconut Grove neighborhood of Miami, the Doors gave the most controversial performance of their career, one that nearly derailed the band. The auditorium was a converted seaplane hangar that had no air conditioning on that hot night and the seats had been removed by the promoter to boost ticket sales. Morrison had been drinking all day and had missed connecting flights to Miami. By the time he arrived drunk, the concert was over an hour late. The restless crowd of 12,000 people packed into a facility designed to hold only 7,000 and were subjected to undue silences in Morrison's singing, which strained the music from the beginning of the performance. Morrison had recently attended a play by an experimental theatre group, The Living Theatre, and was inspired by their antagonistic style of performance art. Morrison taunted the crowd with messages of both love and hate, saying, love me i can't take it no more without no good love i want some lovin ain't nobody gonna love my ass and alternately you're all a bunch of fucking idiots and screaming what are you gonna do about it over and over again As the band began their second song, Touch Me, Morrison started shouting in protest, forcing the band to a halt. At one point, Morrison removed the hat of an onstage police officer and threw it into the crowd. The officer removed Morrison's hat and threw it. Manager Bill Siddons recalled, The gig was a bizarre, circus-like thing. There was this guy carrying a sheep and the wildest people that I'd ever seen. Equipment chief Vince Trenor said, somebody jumped up and poured champagne on Jim, so he took his shirt off. He was soaking wet. Let's see a little skin. Let's get naked. And the audience started taking their clothes off. Having removed his shirt, Morrison held it in front of his groin area and started making hand movements behind it. On March the 5th, the Dade County Sheriff's Office issued a warrant for Morrison's arrest, claiming Morrison had exposed his penis while on stage, shouted obscenities to the crowd, simulated oral sex on guitarist Robbie Krieger, and was drunk at the time of his performance. Morrison turned down a plea bargain that required the Doors to perform a free Miami concert. He was convicted and sentenced to six months in jail with hard labor and ordered to pay a $500 fine. 
Morrison remained free pending an appeal of his conviction. Densmore, Krieger and Manzarek have denied the allegation that Morrison exposed himself on stage that night. Further pressure from disgusted Miami area residents forced local police to issue a warrant for Morrison's arrest. The singer, who had been vacationing out of the country, turned himself into the Federal Bureau of Investigations and returned to Miami, where he went on trial on August the 12th, 1970. Found guilty of a misdemeanor for profanity and drunkenness, he was sentenced to six months hard labor, although the sentence was postponed, while his attorney appealed the conviction. After the trial in Miami, Morrison's life grew more chaotic, his relationships with band members more strained. Searching to recover a new sense of himself, he went back to the poetry that he had loved as a college student. In 1970, he published his first book of verse, The Lords and the New Creature which had been privately printed the year before. Jim Morrison's future with the Doors was clouded in uncertainty as 1970 faded into 1971, but all involved knew things couldn't continue the way they'd been going. Seeking a change and hoping to reorient himself emotionally and creatively, he left the US for a sabbatical in Paris on March the 11th. As tended to be the case with some of Morrison's more memorable decisions, the timing came at an inconvenient time for the Doors. The band had been in school in the studio since late 1970, working on the tracks for what would become their LA Woman album. And although sessions had been completed by the spring of 1971, the record was still being mixed when Morrison departed for Paris. While his bandmates might have wished he'd waited for the project to be finished, they knew he was unwell. In that photo on the album cover, you can see the impending demise of Morrison. Doors keyboardist Ray Manzarek later said of the LA Woman cover shoot, he was sitting down because he was drunk. A psychic would have known that that guy is on the way out. There was a great weight on him. He wasn't the youthful poet I met on the beach at Venice. Morrison's drinking had indeed gotten out of control during the LA Woman sessions. He was said to consume dozens of beers in a day and was having problems completing lyrics and vocal tracks and at first it seemed like Paris might be part of the cure for what ailed him. After meeting up with longtime companion Pamela Corson at an apartment they'd rented in the city, he underwent at least a partial lifestyle change, walking the streets and losing some of the excess weight he'd put on in recent months. Old habits die hard, however, and while Paris may have offered Morrison a somewhat quieter environment and idyllic scenery, the city was also in the midst of a headline-grabbing heroin epidemic in the early 70s, and by most accounts, he soon fell into a downward spiral, alternating between periods of creativity and substance abuse. Dogged by health problems that were exacerbated by the climate, Morrison embarked on a vacation within a vacation with Corson, visiting Toulouse and an assortment of cities along the way. But soon after returning in brighter spirits, he fell back into the Parisian nightlife. The conflicting desires reflected in Morrison's behaviour were born out on a smaller scale in front of those who later professed to know him. When he was sober, he just looked like an American student on holiday, very quiet and shy, Parisian acquaintance Gilles Yepriman later claimed. Once he became drunk, he was a madman. Much of what transpired during Morrison's stay in the city has been shrouded in uncertainty over the years, with opposing accounts and diverging theories purporting to get at the heart of how he was feeling and what he intended to do next. According to drummer John Densmore, Morrison was happy with the finished version of LA Woman and planned to return to Los Angeles, although he hadn't yet decided when. With the Doors continuing to sell records and Morrison just a few months past his 27th birthday, there seemed to be plenty of time to figure out the details. Sadly, he'd never make it back. On the morning of July the 3rd, 1971, Jim Morrison was found dead in the bathtub of the Paris apartment he shared with Pamela Corson. The untimely demise of the Doors frontman stunned the world and left his fans devastated. But the questions surrounding Jim Morrison's death have endured far longer than the short time he spent on earth. According to Corson, Morrison was feeling sick the night before and had decided to take a hot bath. Corson then went back to sleep 
only to find him unresponsive in the water hours later. The official cause of death was listed as heart failure and no autopsy was performed. Morrison's body lay wrapped in dry ice and plastic for 72 hours before he was buried in the city's famous Père Lachaise Cemetery. And if you're one of the many people who think Doors leader Jim Morrison's 1971 demise was suspicious, you might be right. According to The End, Jim Morrison, a book by Sam Burnett, a French-born former New York Times journalist, club manager and friend of Morrison, the rocker died of a massive heroin overdose in the bathroom of the Rock and Roll Circus Club in Paris's Left Bank and was then moved to the tub as part of an astonishing cover-up meant to deflect blame from the posse of drug dealers that Morrison patronised. Burnett claims that in the early hours of July the 3rd, 1971, Morrison showed up at the club looking to buy heroin for his girlfriend Pamela Corson. After scoring and heading for the bathroom, he failed to reappear. About half an hour later, a cloakroom attendant came up to meet me and told me someone was locked in one of the cubicles and wasn't coming out. I got a bouncer to smash the door down, Burnett recalls. He says he found Morrison's body slumped over the toilet. We were certain he'd been snorting heroin because there was foam coming out of his lips as well as blood, Burnett says. He was scared of needles, so never injected drugs. Burnett brought in a customer who worked as a medic who proclaimed Morrison dead. At this point, Burnett says, Morrison's dealers appeared, insisted the singer was still alive, though passed out, and carried the rocker out of the club, saying that they would take care of him. Shortly thereafter, Burnett claimed someone representing the club's owner called, warning him not to tell anyone what had happened. Since 1971, Morrison's fans have flocked to his grave located in the Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris to do drugs, have sex and just honour the rock legend. The grave has been vandalised on several occasions. In 1981, a Croatian sculptor, Miladin Mikulin, created a bust of the legend which was placed on Morrison's new headstone. It had been stolen prior. The bust was defaced through the years and eventually stolen as well in 1988. The current headstone was placed by Morrison's father, Admiral George Stephen Morrison, and the headstone reads a Greek quote that translates to, true to his own spirit. The French wanted Morrison's grave removed from the famous graveyard. However, the request was rejected when discovered how popular the grave is as a tourist attraction. The grave is the second most visited attraction in Paris, the Eiffel Tower being the first. To this day, the Doors continue to sell millions of records. Morrison's and the Doors' music will live on for years to come. 